Hello, everyone. I am Keith Wolf Hughes, General Director of Opera Birmingham, and I'm here with a little preview of a digital concert we will be presenting for you in January, Opera from a Sister's Point of View. And I am so hey. excited. <laughs> I am so excited to have the creator and star of this concert joining me today to give us a little bit of a preview. So welcome, Angela Brown. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited for your constituents to see this show. Excellent. So, Angela, you have sung here before. You did a concert with us in 2012. Um, but for those who didn't see that concert, Angela is an award-winning soprano, has sung all over the states, all over the world, and is known for her interpretations of Verdi's classic heroines, Aida, Leonora, actually behind her, uh, she's got a great poster from her net debut singing that iconic role of Aida. So uh, we are so excited to have you back virtually in Birmingham this year since uh, we can't, can't have you here in person. Um, and actually you know, I've sung twice with you guys. You have. Uh-huh. It was, I did a Christmas concert with you guys. Oh, that's right. I, I'd forgotten about that. I knew you were here for the opening of the Jemison Day Theater at ASFA, but I had forgotten about the Christmas concert. Um, and you'll see Angela has some of her Christmas bling on. We're recording just before the holidays to make sure we get uh, information to you about this great concert. So tell us a little bit about opera from a sister's point of view. What inspired you to create this it's not necessarily a show, it's like, you know, a concert recital, but what inspired you to create this program? Well, it is a show, darling. That's it true. is a show. <laughs> it's a really big show. Now, actually, opera from a sister's point of view. Okay, first of all, you got to relax and lean back I upon say, it. Okay? I will the never do that premise. justice. <laughs> <laughs> the whole premise of opera from a sister's point of view is to have a relaxed atmosphere and to introduce audiences to opera that normally wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. And what was happening in my life at the time when I created it, I realized that, you know, as I began to do my career, cause I started, I, I, this brainchild came about like in 1998. Uh, and I was in the backseat of my agent's car on my way to uh, New York city to, um, uh, compete in the Birgit Nielsen competition at uh, uh, Vio Hall. And um, I was writing down different ideas. And I said, well, you know, opera companies aren't always going to want me because, you know, I was such a fabulous star at that time, 1998. <laughs> no. uh, but I, I, I was thinking ahead. And this is what I tell students all the time. It's like, while you are planning to be fabulous, you need to plan your second act. And so I was thinking opera from a sister's point of view could be that. Uh, I wanted to edutain, as you will, um, audiences that normally wouldn't go to opera. And I was one of those audiences. And I was singing on the stages of the world and I didn't see very many people that looked like me. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought that it was just a black thing that, you know, black folk don't know about opera. So it's my, my uh, mission in life to go out and let you know, black people know about opera. So I started out in churches and stuff. Very soon after that, I found out white folk don't like opera either. <laughs> <laughs> now it's about being uh, exposed, you right. know? And so I wanted to see a very diverse audience mm -hmm. uh, of opera goers because opera is diverse because you can find yourself in opera. There are Asian operas like Madame Butterfly and Turando. There are African operas or uh, black operas like Aida. I don't care how many people you paint up. Aida is based in Africa. Okay. Right. So there are exactly. African uh, operas. There are African American operas like Porgy and Bess. Mm -hmm. There are uh, Italian operas like uh, Tosca, and of course, um, European operas like Die Valkyrie. So right. you can find yourself in opera. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of being exposed to it and to let you know that it's fun, you know, exactly. and you can have fun with it. Exactly. And so as part of that, this just isn't, this isn't just a recital where you sing opera or you sing, you know, a set of Schubert songs, like you're doing your, your graduate recital. This has a, a wide know. range of music and storytelling. So tell us about some of the things when, when you created this, this program, some of the things that you included and, and, you know, how that works 
as you say, to help break down those barriers and introduce mm -hmm. people to something that they didn't know. Sorry, I hit my desk. Okay. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> Honey, we're just having fun. We're just going to go with it today. You know, when I, like I said, I was one of those audiences that was like, what is opera about? I don't understand it. And so I decided to put my spin on it. So mm -hmm. I have a skeleton program, if you will, of different opera heroines mm -hmm. that I sing. And uh, one of the heroines is Tosca. And it's an Italian opera. And, you know, the story, if you really peel the onion of the story of Tosca, honey, that is something else. Tosca is a trip. She's a tour de force. She's jealous. She's a woman. She's jealous. She's fabulous. She's a diva like myself. And she's <laughs> in love with Cavaradossi. And so I begin to tell the audience about the different shades of Tosca right before the aria Visidarte, which is part of the program. And so I make it fun, tongue in cheek. I tell whimsical tales about what I would do or maybe wouldn't do in a situation. And then I give them good vocal technique and singing because we, we have fun with the plots, but honey, we sings for real. <laughs> exactly, okay. exactly. And it's not just the classics. It's not just Aida or Tosca. You also include uh, an aria from um, Margaret Garner, which you premiered at Michigan Opera Theater, and include works by young African-American composers, songwriters. Why is it important to have that kind of variety in addition to showing people how fun the classics, the traditional works can be? Well, I have always been of the adage that you, uh, you, if you give a little dessert, you know, mm -hmm. then the strong meat can come in there in between. So I want people to be well-versed, to paint with every color on their palette, to put in all the seasonings when you're making a good stew and let it, you know, stir up and, 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 and be in there together so that it tastes flavorful. So I give them some opera. I give them some art songs. I give them some new works in opera. I give them spirituals as well because all of it is part of um music making and building and if i can only get you in the audience one time mm -hmm. i'm gonna give you enough to chew on so that you can go hmm i understand that uh uh, uh the symphony is playing hmm maybe i'll go check that out mm -hmm. or i remember miss brown talking about uh, Aida and the um, the uh, dance and the triumphal scenes and there's a ballet coming up and they're doing a section of that. Maybe I'll go and check that out. I want to give you an opportunity to just explore and expand your mind. So if I can only get you in the audience for a short period of time, maybe I can then get you to come back to right. some programming because I was there. Exactly. And I think it's, I think it's important, and I'm glad that you include these new works as well. Most people, when you think of opera, think of, you know, the old dead Europeans who have written it. And there's so much great work being written that you say, you may not see yourself on stage in some of the classics, but you certainly see yourself on stage in things like Margaret Garner, Champion, uh, American Soldier. I mean, there are so many powerful stories and great performers who are doing these works still and we're just not we're we just haven't made ourselves aware of that yet exactly now you imagine the show when you created it as a one woman show but mm -hmm. as you say you have a skeleton of the show so it can be no, done a lot of different ways the show that we're presenting in January which we did in partnership with Cincinnati Opera has four great young emerging artists performing with you how is it different doing the show when there are other people? Because obviously it's not just you singing, you have some duets, there's a couple of quartets and different things, but how is it different when you're not just doing your one woman show and you've got other people involved in the, in the, in the act? Well, you know, I have to say that I have always wanted to have a vehicle that I would be able to introduce young performing artists uh, on my platform. So mm -hmm. as if to shine some of my light onto them and then give them an opportunity to, uh, to be seen to a larger audience. 
And so um, having them in this program with me, first of all, I don't have to do all the singing because <laughs> I sing and I talk the whole night and that is that can be tiring but because i've done it for a number of years i have learned how to pace myself mm -hmm. but to to be a fly on the wall so to speak and to have these young professional artists come out and do some duets with me or do a quartet or do mm -hmm. some solos i mean and then just sit back tell their stories tell the stories of their opera, mm -hmm. you know, moment, and then sit back and enjoy them too. I really, really enjoy doing this, this program because it's, it's giving back in a way mm -hmm. and uh, it does my heart good and my voice. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was privileged to be able to come see the taping of the concert. Uh, I think this was recorded back in September. And it was interesting, as you say, to hear the stories of everyone and how they came to their point of their career. And there's something, uh, and I bring this up because it's the holiday season, uh, something that is familiar, not just amongst you and the four who sang, but for so many singers is a lot of us got our start in the church. We, you know, we didn't think, we, we didn't grow up thinking we were going to be opera singers. We might have been, you know, involved in some other way. Tell us a little bit about your journey, because I know there's another Alabama connection in addition to singing here at Opera Birmingham. Tell us a little bit about your journey from you know, a young singer singing in the church and to becoming the diva you are today. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> well, I will say that I started out singing my grandfather's Baptist church. I, I, my first solo was You Can't Beat God's Giving no matter how you try. We know that as the offering song. And I think I'm the only one that knows all the verses to that. <laughs> and um, going from there, I did a lot of community theater. I was very active in musicals and stuff at my high school, Christopher Saddock's High School here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And then I went on to Oakwood University, which was college at the time, in Huntsville, Alabama. Exactly. And that is the connection that I have with Alabama. It, if it wasn't for Oakwood and my teacher, Ginger Beasley, who has Ars Nova School of the Arts there in Huntsville uh, now, uh, I don't know what my um, trajectory or my career would have been like because I didn't know I was going to sing opera. I, I started out in my grandfather's church. I loved gospel music. I loved um, uh, singing musical theater and all. But when I got to Oakwood, um, I found that and I, when I first went to Oakwood, I wanted to study music and be a Bible instructor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I say that the Lord has given me bigger pulpits now. So uh, I'm just enjoying the journey that he has me on. Excellent. Do you have a favorite role that you love to perform? Or, and the other part of the question is, is there something you've always wanted to do that you've just not yet had the right opportunity? Well, the first part, uh -huh. I do have a favorite role, which is Tosca. You would think it would be Aida because, you know, but I love Aida. I love Aida, but every Achilles heel of the soprano is that high C, <laughs> pianissimo high C, and O Patria Mia. It's like everybody waits for that. If it has a couple of sparkles on it, cracks. Uh, no one remembers all them other high Cs you sang all night long, all the float. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm, I love Aida. I do, I do. But I have to say Tosca is my favorite because that Peppa is crazy. She's jealous. She's, mm -hmm. she's fiery. She's, um, um, she's vulnerable. It's, I mean, there's so many layers to her onion to peel all night that it's exactly. exciting and interesting to me to portray her every night, regardless if I have one performance or 20. I'm right. loving me some Tosca. Tosca uh, is a great show. Oh, such yes. a great show. And, and I love all the themes mm -hmm. that each, each character has. You know, I mean, it's one that never gets brought up to me anyway, that gets brought up as an opera 
for um, new opera goers, mm -hmm. but actually it's a great opera for new opera goers because of the different themes you can hear. Mm -hmm. You always know when Scarthy is coming in, or you exactly. always know when Tosca's getting ready to sweep into the room, <laughs> or when Spoletta slinks out of the room. You, I mean, it's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. So think about that on your list of new operas to, I mean, operas to introduce, uh, introduce to new uh, opera goers. Right. But as far as something that I, I still want to do that I haven't done, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if I had an opportunity, I think I might want to try a Turandot because it's short and it's a good screen. <laughs> <laughs> That oh, is true because you know, she she doesn't even start singing until Act Two. You got mm -hmm. you show up and you and you get the best of the diva. You show up in Act One and just look fabulous. Exactly. And then in Act Two, you show up and you you again you kind of just look fabulous while you sing your riddles, and then yeah. you know great love music in Act Three and turned off and, my favorite when I the, when I got started as a young singer. Um, back in Virginia, I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia. I was in the opera chorus for Turned Out. It was the first show I was ever in. I had seen performances. First show I was ever in, and that's the reason I am doing what I am doing today. It's oh. a great show, a great show. Isn't it wonderful how you can find things, how things inspire you as a child, mm -hmm. and that can lead you on through, like a thread through your life. You don't even know that you're going to go into what you end up, because I didn't know I was going to end up an opera singer, but I was exposed <clears throat> to opera early on in my high school years. And I was taking voice lessons from my choral teacher, getting ready for the all state solo competitions that they have, like Nats kind of right. thing, but it was for high schools. Right. And uh, I would always sing from the Messiah, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. I had to take that breath, so I had to always put a good K. Uh -huh. like, so I can get that little quick breath, and it doesn't seem like I took that breath. Right. And I would always win, and I had no idea I would end up being in the opera diva. Uh -huh. Had no idea. <laughs> so earlier on, you talked about act two. You know, we all, as we grow, as our careers grow, you know, we have to be thinking about where we may be heading. And while we're on this pandemic hiatus and we're not performing the way we would typically perform, you have been taking advantage of some of those Act Two opportunities. Uh, hopefully Act One's not over, it's just the intermission before we come back and finish it. Uh, exactly. But you, you have another creative project that you have developed earlier this year, it, which is the podcast Melanated Moments in Classical Music, which I had not heard about until um, working on this show. Tell me more about that, because I can't wait to start listening to it. Well, actually, to be totally honest, this was something that we had in the can pre-pandemic. Uh, okay. And the music sociologist, Joshua Thompson, invited me to be a part of it. So it wasn't something that I developed, but I became, we developed together after I was asked to be a co-host. And um, Melanated Moments in Classical Music is just that. We spotlight um, composers, singers, uh, playwrights, uh, librettists, whoever and whomever has um, contributed mm -hmm. to uh, Black music, Black storytelling mm -hmm. in some kind of way, regardless of what they're what, what their nationality or whatever is, right. or race. Um, so, so we could talk about a white person or a Persian person or a, a, a Jewish person. It doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you know, what they are. Uh, but long as the subject matter is Black, uh, we highlight that. And we don't go into deep dives. Mm -hmm. We just give you a little bit, and then we let you go into right. the deep dive. Because it's only a 20-minute at the most podcast because you know we we uh consume things so quickly and right. we wanted to keep it snappy and fun mm -hmm. and edgy so uh yeah joshua and i with along with um classical music indie that's what we're under uh we do melanated moments and we're actually we won 
Okay, we were surprised. We were shocked. Best new black music podcast for 2020. We won that award. So through uh, Black Music uh, Podcasting Awards. Mm -hmm. So that was a great honor. And we have been allotted a uh, season two. So that will hit the airwaves uh, early next year. And uh, so we're just excited. We're excited. And uh, it's done well. It's done as far as podcasting Mm -hmm. situations go. It's on up there. It's doing very well for itself. And uh, you can find melanated moments in classical music on any platform where you get your podcasts. Awesome. Well, I'm looking for something to start in the new year because I just finished uh, a long series um, during this break. So I'm looking forward to that. And, you know, how timely is that as with everything going on and classical music, looking at the lack of diversity on our stages, both performers as well as conductors and, and creatives for that for this piece to be here to help us find, you know, because there is a huge breadth and depth of African-American music that we just have not explored in, in our communities. I'm really excited to, to look for, to, to listen to that and, and see what I can learn that can, as you say, spark that interest to find the next thing that we can bring to our stages here. And in addition to your performing career, and I think you've been doing this for a little while, you also teach you are, uh, have your own studio. What's it like approaching opera from, you know, that different angle, not from the one who is going to be singing and creating it, but helping facilitate, helping prepare someone for the stage? What's that like? Well, you know, I have to say that teaching didn't come quickly Mm -hmm. because I have been very busy in my career. But, you know, when pandemic-y things started happening, um, it did slow me down. So my, of course, it really blossomed and blew up as far as teaching. I teach in a high school here in Indianapolis virtually. And my studio, which is housed at the Indianapolis Opera Mm -hmm. here in Indianapolis. And um, being able to take young people and give them some of, to tell them, some of my experiences on the stage because what I have done for a long time are master classes. And right. that's what I feel like uh, I'm blessed or well versed in. Uh, I, I, I'm a good coach. I can get it out of you, you know. Um, and it's, it's, it's fun uh, for me to help plant a seed and to see a light bulb go on for the singers that I'm uh, working with because I'm not real technical. I am definitely a visionary. I am about giving you visuals Mm -hmm. to place yourself in a a certain role, Mm -hmm. a certain vocal approach, um, how you feel, your support, your placement, and your breath. Mm -hmm. I am very good at giving you visuals and most of the time, students catch right onto it, and that is a nugget right. of something that they can take. Because especially in master classes, if you're not coming to me as a perpetual student all the time, then you need that nugget mm-hmm. that you can take and say, "Ah, now I understand." So it's been very rewarding to 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 see those aha moments happen in young people's faces, and even older professional seasoned exactly and has has doing that not changed the way you sing but made you think of what you do differently or you know learn something new about what you do that you might not have thought because you're thinking of it in a different way every day Mm -hmm. every day when you teach you become a better singer a better performer Mm -hmm. because then you are actually not on autopilot you have taken what you have what you do organically you know, because after you've done all your training and stuff, as as people will tell you, once you, you know, leave the studio, you got to throw all that training away and get out there and perform. We ain't got time to be telling you how to do this, that, and the other one. You get out there, you just better do it. Right. And being able then to take those moments and break them down and boil them down to their essence and then be able to give them back mm-hmm. to a student helps you as a singer. It's like, yeah, that was some good stuff. Hmm. Why? I need to go back to that. You know, I, I need to 
need to remember that. I need to remember that myself. I'm pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know? So yes, it does, to answer your question. Yes, it does help your singing and, and your stage department. Those times when you are having uh, uh, a moment on stage and most and a, every performer does have one of those, oh, okay, I'm scared, I'm approaching. But just remember, mm-hmm. all right, just relax and let it go, you know? So yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. We are so excited to be, to have opera. Let me see if I can get this right. Opera from a sister's point of view. There you go, boo boo. Uh, we are so excited to be presenting this show in January. Uh, we'll have more information coming out for all of our audiences. It's on our website now. So of course you can go get information there. Definitely make sure you check out the podcast, Melanated Moments in Classical Music and all of the things that Angela is doing. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday. Are you Thank ready? Thank you so much. Are you ready for I'm As ready as I'm gonna get y'all. You know, it was funny. My brother and uh, sister-in-law and everybody, they've already brought their gifts over mm-hmm. and we've already, you know, given off out the, uh, basically the uh, uh, gift cards. Right. And so we're just gonna sit back, enjoy. My husband's gonna do some Caribbean food. First time Ooh. I've ever had it for the holidays. And we have a new little puppy dog and we're going to enjoy family and watch a lot of movies. (laughs) Exactly, same thing here, same thing here. Well, have a wonderful holiday, have a great new year. To all of our Opera Birmingham patrons, stay tuned for more information about opera from a sister's point of view. And we will see you in the new year. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye Bye.